Just a little about myself. I came from Guatemala City. I work at the data science team at Zoom, and I'm a computer science engineer from Universidad de San Carlos. Just a comment, uh, uh, not related to the talk. Just three days ago, we have a, a volcano eruption in our country. It, it has been very, uh, there's many dead people, so if you can help or you want to support our country, there's a lot of uh, GoFundMe, uh, GoFundMe campaigns. So let's get started. So my talk today is a little academic. It's a little research I've been doing from a really recent model and paper. And it's proposed by Google DeepMind. It's called Differentiable Neural Computers. This is a really complex model. It's, uh, it has a lot of components in, in it. It's really difficult to digest. So I try to make the idea easier to digest and to uh, show to you the possible applications so that you can uh, research more on this topic. So as I said, the model is proposed by DeepMind just uh, a year and a half ago, so it's really recent. But I personally think that this model has a, a lot of potential. So what's the basic idea? The basic idea is a neural network like, uh, like the ones we know and the ones we love, but with an external memory. The neural network can access this external memory and can write and read to it. The nice thing or the, the interesting thing about this is that the IO, the IO operations are not programmed like we used to do in, in, in typical programming, but are learned by the neural network. This means that we don't specify how to access the memory. It's up to the neural network to learn. So let's think about the main computing architecture of today's computing. It's called the von Neumann architecture. If we think about the von Neumann architecture, there's basically two main components, a CPU and a memory. And of course, uh, memory access uh, subsystems, but the main blocks are the CPU and a memory. The idea of the DNC is to, is to use this as a, as a template or as a building block, but the interesting thing is that the CPU, it's a neural network. It, it is called the controller, so the controller neural network takes the role of the CPU, and you have an external memory like, like we have in our computers, that means this is the RAM of the system. So you can, have, you can see here the, a comparison. In the left side, well, in your right side, we have uh, the original von Neumann architecture, the one that is used today in, in almost every computing system. And on the other side, we have the DNC. As you can see, the architecture is very, very similar. But the difference is that the processor, the CPU, it's a neural network. It can be a feed-forward neural network or a recurrent neural network. It doesn't matter. And other of the difference is that in typical programming, we gave the computer inputs and it performs calculation and returns outputs. But in this case, instead of doing typical programming, what we do is a machine learning problem. So we gave it input data and we expect back some predictions. If it's a supervised learning problem, we expect back a, pr a prediction vector. If it, if it is used in a, in a reinforcement learning problem, we, we will get back an action prediction. That means uh, a probability vector over all the possible actions. So where, this, where did this model came from? It came from neuroscientists and computer scientists working together in the DeepMind team. This was proposed by Demis Hassabis and Alex Graves in DeepMind. And the basic architecture of the memory system, that means the memory allocation, is based on computer science. That means like our operating systems work. But the reading of the memory is based on neuroscience, the way our brain works when we retrieve memories of our past. So basically, this is a neuroscience meets AI model. And what's the high level architecture of this model? Well, as we said, there is a neural network which we will call controller. And this is like the CPU of the system. It performs computation on, on input data, 
But there are some mechanisms called read and write heads, which perform I.O. from memory. The controller interacts with the read and write heads and use memories to, to computation, similar to what we have in our, in our current computing systems. So what's the difference with this and a common neural network? As we know, neural networks are really good at pattern recognition, perception tasks, sensory input, and quick decision making. But they are not really that good for other things like planning and reasoning, use memories and facts from the, from the past. Well, at, uh, at some extent, because neuro, uh, recurrent neural networks like LSTM networks can do this at a little extent, but they are not that great for this. They can generalize to new tasks, and they can't work with complex data structures, like associative data structures, like simple linked lists or graph structures. But the computing systems that we have been using over the, over the years are really good at this. So we need some way to combine the computing systems that we have used in a long time with the power of a neural network, and that's what the DNC is. So how does DNC solve this problem? Well, it's the best of both worlds. It's a memory-based architecture, like the von Neumann architecture, but using machine learning. So we get the benefits of pattern recognition and uh, perception from machine learning, but we get the planning and reasoning based on, on memory-based computer architectures. And also, we can use associative data structures like graphs and trees in these models. So we are mixing uh, both benefits. And the conclusion is that, like a computer, it can organize knowledge, it can store facts, it can store information, and use that information for future usage. But like a neural network, it learns to do that from data. So how does the reading work in this model? Well, we will do some analogies and we will find some similarities between this model and some neuroscience models. What, does, what that means is that the, the DNC retrieves memories from its external memory bank using analogies from the brain. That means the neuroscience team that developed this provided some insights to the engineering team of how our brain works. And then they implemented that in this model. We will see some examples of it. And we will use for that a book called Foundations of Human Memory, which is a, a, a famous book on neuroscience. So how does the knowledge retrieval work in this model? Well, it is based on something they call attention mechanisms. And what are these attention mechanisms? Basically, they are some way to specify or to decide which memory locations to retrieve in a single operation. But we commonly use one memory location at a time when we are programming. In this system, you can get multiple memory locations, but you pay some attention to some places and more attention to others. That's what the attention mechanisms are, and we will see some examples of these attention mechanisms. So we have here some comparison. We have the computational perspective and the neuroscience perspective of the attention mechanisms. In the, comput in the computational perspective, what we are doing is deciding which external memory lo location to read. In the neuroscience perspective, is wh what we're doing is how the brain decides which memories to retrieve when we are exposed to some experience. So, this will be very easy to understand. The first, uh, uh, the first model is the attribute vectors from neuroscience. This model says that our memory is a bank of different memories and every memory has, a, has some attribute. In the computational perspective, this means that we have N memory locations and W attributes for every memory location. Or in, in von Neumann, uh, in von Neumann lit literature, it's called the word size.
And we can see here an example. This is the, basically the, the external memory of the DNC. It has multiple memory locations, and every memory location has W attributes or word size attributes. And one of the interesting ways that the DNC uses to retrieve content from memory is content-based or similarity-based retrieval. Again, we have here some computational perspective and neuroscience perspective. So the, the computational perspective is that we will retrieve memory locations that are similar to a key, which the DNC has, uh, uh, has emitted. This means that the DNC emits a key, and we will try to look for a value, a key value pair. But the interesting thing is that it's not an exact uh, uh, matching, but a similarity matching. In neuroscience perspective, there's a model which propose we can remember experiences when we are exposed to similar experiences. For example, if we read a book, we sometimes remember, oh, it does, this is similar to something I read in the past. So the neuroscience perspective is implemented in the computational perspective using a similarity-based retrieval, which in this case is a, a cosine similarity. And we have here some illustration. Basically, we have uh, some read keys and a write key. We can, we can have as many read keys as we want, but we will have only one write key. And then we do some content lookup using cosine similarity. This, is, this was the first attention mechanism, but the DNC has other attention mechanisms, as, as I said. The second attention mechanism is a time attention mechanism, a temporal attention mechanism, which is based, again, in a neuroscience model, which in this case is called the temporal context model. And the neuroscience idea is it's easier for us to remember things in the order they happen. For example, Try to say the alphabet in a distinct order, and then try to say the alphabet order. You will see that it's easier for us to say the alphabet order. So the team used this model. And in the computational side, or in the computational implementation of this model, what we have is a linked list of memory locations. That means that we write to the memory, and then we store in a linked list the memory position that we just wrote. And then we can use this linked list to retrieve memories in the order, in the order they were written to the memory bank, order by time. Or we can retrieve them backwards. And we have here some code and some math. I'm not going to go deep into this map because there's a lot of components in it, and it's, it's a little complex to, to digest. So we'll go to the third attention mechanism. We have now two attention mechanisms, similarity-based and temporal-based. Now we have another uh, neuroscience model. In this case, it's called search of associative memory, or SAM model, which says we humans have a dual memory system. We have a short memory system and a long memory system. Some people have uh, 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 one bigger than the other, and, and we are not all the same. But the idea that our memory is a dual system, a long memory system and a shorter memory system. The DNC also uses this or implements this. And in this case, it uses a LSTM recurrent neural network as the short-term storage and external memory as the, as the long-term storage as we can see here. We have on the right side the, the LSTM cell, the recurrent neural network, and we have the memory cell, which is our long-term storage. All of these attention mecha mechanisms were based in neuroscience, but as I said, there's also a lot, of, a lot of computer science in this. And one of the attention mechanisms based on computer science is the dynamic memory allocation. 
For those that are familiar with computer science, this is, is what our operating system does. So basically, we have a usage vector, which is incremented when we write to memory. And this usage vector is then used to decide which memory locations to release and which memory locations to allocate for new memories. The computational perspective is dynamic memory allocation from operating systems. And the neuroscience perspective is we can add new memories to our brain when we are exposed to new experience, or we can reinforce our memories when we repeat experiences. And we have here an illustration of this. Basically, we have a write vector, which says what we will write to the memory, an erase vector, we first erase and then write to the memory. And finally, a write key. The write key is used to make the similarity lockup, as, as we said. So taking all of these components, this is the basic idea or, or the, the basic architecture of the model. Basically, you can see the neural, net, the neural network taking inputs and computing outputs. But before computing outputs, it also retrieves content from the memory and writes content to the memory. So we can see here that the output of the system, it's not a function of its input, but a function of its input and of the memories it decides to retrieve in a single step. And on the, other, on the other side, up to the left, we can see the temporal memory matrix, which is the one that the system uses to retrieve memories in the, in the temporal attention mechanism. And this is the architecture when you see it from TensorBoard. My suggestion is that if you are going to try to experiment with this, use TensorBoard, because this is a really complex model. I'm talking here just about a little high-level discussion of the model, but it's really complex. So the idea is that you can use TensorBoard to debug it. This is the, this is the TensorBoard graph that my implementation has. Maybe you will find another optimal one, another better one, who knows? But the idea is to use TensorBoard to debug it. And basically, here's a brief description of what we say right now. At each time step, which in, in von Neumann architecture, it's called clock cycle, the DNC does, does this. It gets an input data. This can be, for a supervised learning problem, this can be common input data, or it can be also a reinforcement learning problem, which in this case will be a perception of the agent. And the DNC calculates its output based on the input and on the memories it decided to retrieve. One interesting thing, one interesting thing here is that the DNC decides what to retrieve. It's not programmed by us. So the DNC decides how to interact with the memory. This means that it will decide what to write and, and when to write, and it will decide what to read from memory. And the DNC also sends the memories that, have the, that just read to the next time step. That's why we can see a, a recurrent connection here in the, in the controller side. So the output of the DNC is a function of its inputs and of its memory, or better said, of the memory locations that it decided to read. But we have been saying, the DNC decides, the DNC decides. So this sounds like, uh, like it's a person deciding. How does the DNC do this? Well, it's artificial intelligence, right? So that's where the differential part of the name came. Every component of the system uses weights similar to those of a common neural network. This means that there are read weights, write weights, uh, content lookup weights, temporal lookup weights, everything has weights. So you, if you have weights, you can use gradient descent and you can use back propagation to train it. So that's how the DNC decides this. And that's why the differential uh, word in its name. So basically we use training data like we do in, in machine learning problems. And the system learns to interact with the memory using this training data. 
So every, everyone wants to see applications, right? The idea is that maybe you will have some ideas to apply this. I will talk some of the ideas that I have uh, uh, used, but maybe you will have new ideas after seeing the, the basic architecture. So the potential applications basically are problems that require, that, that require reasoning and knowledge, things that a common neural network can't do, and problems in which you have complex data structures, like graphs. We will see some examples using graphs. This is one of the experiments I made. This is using the baby dataset. Are you familiar with the baby dataset? It's a natural language processing dataset. So basically, in the baby dataset, you have some, some stories written in natural language. For example, John is in the playground. John picked up the football. Where is the football? You can't easily do, a, or you can't easily work in a problem like this using a common neural network because, because it requires some planning and some reasoning. But using this system, you can do it. You, you can train it using the baby data set and create a chatbot, but not a probabilistic chatbot like the ones we, are, we commonly use, but a chatbot that can reason, that can, that can think. For example, this is one of my experiments. John is in the playground. John pick up the football. Where is the football? That requires some intelligence and some reasoning. And the answer was in the playground. Here's a harder or difficult story. I'm, I'm not going to read it, but you can see there that it's a long story and it requires some reasoning. You can't get an answer to this question using a, a common neural network are a probabilistic neural network. But the DNC can get an answer because it can reason using it, its external memory. This is one of my experiments. The potential of this experiment is to create a reasoning chatbot, not a probabilistic chatbot. But there's also some experiments that the, that the DeepMind did using this system. So basically, you can do problems that require graph reasoning with this system. And one of the interesting things is that the system does not need to be retrained. You can just train it with random graphs, and it will learn to use these graphs. And then you feed it on a specific graph, and it will work just fine without retraining. This is a step to general artificial intelligence, something we are very far off. But it's, maybe this is the first step. So for example, we have here DeepMind train the system with uh, random graphs, and then feed the London, uh, the London train subsystem or uh, underground system to it, and start to ask questions to it. For example, what's the, what's the shortest path from station A to station B? And the system uses its memory to navigate in this graph and get an answer. I have a, a, an animation at the end of the, of the presentation in which the, uh, DeepMind used this in a, in a similar problem, but in this case, in a family tree problem, without retraining. That's the interesting thing. They fed the, the family tree to the system and then asked questions like, who is the mother of the sister of John? And the system used its memory to retrieve an answer. So as you can see, this is a, this is a really recent model, but with a lot of potential towards general artificial intelligence. It can be used also for reinforcement learning. For example, it was used in a grid game. And you, you, got, you give the, the system some constraints, and then you specify to it that it needs to satisfy a constraint. And the interesting thing is that it will use its memory to, make the to win the game, satisfying the constraint. As you can see, this requires some reasoning and planning, which is something we humans do very, very well, but a new common neural network can't do. So basically, this is the end of my presentation. Here's some references if, in case you want to, to explore most of, more of this model. This is a really complex model. I had to read the paper like five times to understand it, but it's really worth it. And there's, some, there's my contact if you want to 
to ask questions or anything about this model, I'm, you can write to me a, an email or anything and, and I'll write back to you. And just to finish the video, the animation video, this is the family tree problem. In this problem, after the system, after the system was trained on random graphs, then you feed to it a family tree graph and then ask questions to it, and the system answers the question. So basically, this is an animation, but you are feeding the graph there. You are defining nodes and edges of those nodes, and the system writes to memory. It decides in which memory position to store the information. It is not programmed. So then you ask questions to it. And it returns an answer. This answer will require reasoning and planning. So it's, that's the very nice thing about this model. And thank you so much. I just want to take a minute for, for what I mentioned at the start of a conference. There's a tragedy in, in our country right now. Uh, we have a natural disaster, so in case you want to support and help, there's, a, there's lots of GoFundMe campaigns. Thank you so much. All right, if anybody has any questions, we have a mic set up here. Please come forward and ask your question. Hey, um, so is this something that is computationally feasible for anyone other than DeepMind to do? Uh, not really. I, okay. I have a, I have two GPUs on my home, and I work with them. And uh, with two GPUs, you can train by two days or something like that, and it works. It's really computationally ex expensive, but you can do it at home if you have some access to GPUs or in the cloud. I also have two GPUs at home. Oh, and then you can work with it. Awesome. Good talk, thanks a lot. Um, when, when you were doing your, your baby experiments, did you try and compare with just LSTM? And if you did, were you using what, F1 score, precision recall, and, um, and sort of a tangent, like you showed us a good positive outcome, but did you have lots of negative outcomes as well, and what did they look like? Oh, the negative outcome will be that it's computationally expensive, I think, and uh, that it's really, it's really sensible to hyperparameters. You have to find the exact hyperparameter combination to make it work. No, but, but what I mean by negative outcome is like there you were saying, uh, who is Emily afraid of? And it, it could have said dinosaur, right? It, oh, so, performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like the precision recall, I guess, is what you're measuring? Uh, I, always, I always use F1 score. Yeah, F1. And, and so then did you compare with LSTM straight up? Uh, there's really a. Uh, an increase in F1 score compared to LSTMs, uh, but I don't know if the computationally expensive part will, uh, I don't know how to yeah. say it, will balance. balance, yes. Thanks for your talk, Luis, uh, very interesting. <clears throat> I was wanting to ask you uh, if that independent inner voice that helps the uh, DNC decide what to read and write would you say, or do you think that's maybe the beginnings of it developing a conscience? Mm -hmm. Interesting question. I don't think it's developing a conscience, but it's uh, developing human behavior. Hi. Um, great, talk. great talk, thank you. Um, is it possible to supply the confidence with the facts, along with the facts, so that it just, for example, uh, you don't provide the straight facts to the network like relationship but like probably like 90 percent probably this is a uh, sister of this is this entity and then i rely on it and this data when giving answers uh, i'm not sure if i understand your question but uh, the probabilities are there because the output is a softmax uh, distribution so you get like uh, uh, a high probability for the for the most possible answer, and also you have some probabilities for other answers. So 
as in common machine learning problems, you have a probability distribution. Yeah, I mean, that, that would be the output, the, the probability, but with the input, when you feed the network with oh, the, the data input, yes. and uh, you just, you're just not sure that this is true, but you are confidently quite confident about some fact and you, you want to share this with your network, your training. Is it possible to do that? If, if I can share my code? When you when you are feeding the when you are training the data uh, the network sorry uh, you just you not only provide the data uh, the, um, the facts but your own the, the trainer's confidence level about this fact and want to I want for example to use this data when the network gives me the answer. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm not really understanding <laughs> your question. So uh, at this point, we have reached our time, and I want to make sure that we have enough time to get the next speaker. So why don't you guys follow up or any further questions uh, offline? And can we have one last round of applause for our speaker?